is, 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 but he, but he, and he, he, meant, he was mentioning how that sometimes we, he, he, or you said, you know, sometimes we like to take credit for how many people that we've touched in a positive way, made them, you know, take up Krishna consciousness and things like that, but we neglect to notice maybe how many that we've actually pushed away from Krishna consciousness <laughs> by, by, our, by our behavior. And, so, and that's, a, that's a tremendous cruelty and, and a type of violence, actually, if we do that. And so he, he was, so he, he was, he, and him one the example you gave was, was that, uh, that, that sometimes your people will have some kind of pre-existing belief, you know, either religious, spiritual, or even just a regular, you know, world belief. Mm-hmm. And, and if we hear that, oftentimes, then we'll want to just crush that. You know, like, uh, some, like in, in my most cynical moments, uh, sometimes in my experience this guy I thought, well, if, if we didn't have all of Prabhupada's written word, and his recordings and things, that if it was simply according to what people remembered and practiced, that uh, the three things that we would, we have, re- we just said Prabhupada taught us, three things, smash, defeat, and kick on the face with boots. Because <laughs> 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 you know, those things we, we, ta- we, we see, uh, and, and, you know, sometimes, sometimes we, we, we take that up. So we want to immediately tell them the real truth. That this is nonsense. This is this, and this is this, and 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 and, and, and but that's the one thing that, that's sustaining them. And as soon, as soon as you attack that deeply held belief, they become very you know the, the, it, it hurts them and it makes them feel defensive. Yeah, you because know, it because because it, it's it's not only challenging their belief, but it's also saying something about them that you're you're a fool because you believe something that's un, that, that that's ridiculous. It, it, it carries it carries both of those things. It's not, not it's not only just attacking kind of the foundation of their intellectual existence, but it's also a personal attack. They will take it as such a personal attack. That you know that that you know. What do you know? Mm. And sometimes yeah. we sometimes we mean it that way, because we think yeah. I am a great I'm a great knower of the truth, and so they they feel that. that That's true. You know, there is a, a verse in the Bhagavad Gita uh, with 3.26. Na buddhi bhedam janayet agyanam karma sanginam joshayet sarva karmani vidvan yukta samachar. So, Krishna is sitting over here, do not disturb the minds of less intelligent people. Mm-hmm. You know, agyanam karma sanginam. He is giving two disqualifications there. Saying that agyana, they are ignorant and they are attached. Mm-hmm. And even if you are, you are knowledgeable and you are detached. Still don't disturb their minds. Joshayet Sarva Karmani. Engage them to gradually, as Prabhupada said, develop their Krishna consciousness. So one significant point is that you, you mentioned the word intellectual existence. Hmm. The foundation of the intellectual existence. The Sanskrit word is buddhi. Prabhupada uses the word mind over there. Yeah. Now buddhi bhedam janayit. Prabhupada said don't disturb the mind. Yeah. But um, the technical word there is na buddhi bhedam. Bheda means to create holes. Don't create holes in their intelligence. Mm. That they have an intellectual foundation or intellectual structure. Don't create holes in that. So, <coughs> in a sense, so uh, my understanding would be when Prabhupada using the word disturb the don't disturb the minds. He's not using uh, he's not using mind in the technical sense to differentiate mind and intelligence. Mm. He's saying don't agitate people basically. Mm-hmm. That is the point he's saying. So, people. Uh, n- I have found that especially in the postmodern world that we are living in, you can't really definitively prove anything. Because mm. every argument you can come up with a counter argument for that. So ultimately what will sustain people is whether they experience something. Mm. So they experience a human warmth with us, they experience a spiritual warmth by their practice of bhakti. And sometimes, if we are too confrontational or dismissive, then we do deprive people of the opportunity to experience that warmth. Mm-hmm. And then, so I, you know, I was in Detroit in, on Prabhupada Disappearance Day, so I, you know, I was asked to speak over there on that occasion. So I spoke on that, there's a truth that lights the way, and there's a truth that warms the heart. Mm-hmm. So, we sometimes emphasize so much on the truth that lights the way. This is the right way, this is the wrong way. But people don't care really. If only the truth that warms the heart, that, that inspires them, that encourages them, that connects them, that's what will inspire people to move on. And if you look at, like you said, we would remember, 
if Prabhupada's uh, prominent memory for most people would be that smash, defeat and kick, kick in the face. <laughs> now, that's true. And uh, I mean, that Prabhupada did make statement like that. But if you look at Prabhupada's memories, as told by his followers, uh, by his disciples especially, you know, most of those memories are about their personal interactions and how Prabhupada touched their hearts. So, it, Prabhupada confronting and uh, defeating misconceptions, okay, that's nice. But that's not what attracted people primarily to him. It was his personal warmth and personal care which they felt in his presence. So, Prabhupada offered a truth that showed the, that lit the way and also warmed the heart. So sometimes we just focus on the part of the truth that lit the way. And we don't talk about the truth that warmed the heart. So we have to have a balance of both. And especially in today's world, I feel the truth that warms the heart is even more important. And then the truth that lights the way, people will want to go along the way. Otherwise, even if they know that this is okay, this is the right way, but still they may not I don't want to go along this way. I don't really care about it. So I have had some, maybe all of us probably have had some experiences of uh, people getting fried out because of excessively strong, uh, strong preaching. Is one of my god brothers. He says that you know, when devotees come new to our movement, we feed them fried pakodas, <laughs> and then when they become regular devotees, we fry them like pakodas. It's <laughs> yes. So it's sad. You want to say something? Yeah. have to apply that in our, uh, our lives, in yeah. our preaching. And, uh, really. That's true. So if you look at in 17.15, which I quoted on that day also, Krishna says, Anudvega karam vakyam satyam priya hitam chai swadhyaya abhyasaram chai vanvayam tapochyate. He talks about austerity of speech. And the first thing he says in austerity of speech is, speak non-agitatingly. Anudveg Karam Vakyam. So Bhishma gives some instructions on Dharma to, uh, to Yudhishthira in the Mahabharata. And there he tells uh, what are the characteristics of speech, of an of a ideal kind of speech. So he says first is it should be encouraging. Second is it should be truthful. It's interesting, he praises being encouraging First. before being truthful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, again, there was some uh, there was some survey done in, uh, I think it was Wisconsin University. There was a group of students who were learning writing. And they were boys and they were girls. So the boys decided to come together and they said that, you know, whatever all of us write, we will review it and uh, we will uh, we'll find out what are the faults in each other's writings so that we can all improve. Now the girls, they just come together and they decided to do the opposite. They said, whatever you write, we will find the good points in it and we will appreciate those good points. And then, the 20 years down the line, researchers observed this group of students and they found among the boys, not one of them had become a published writer. And even in general, none of them were in their normal correspondences known as uh, good writers, articulate writers, even normal emails or something like that. And many of, and majority of them expressed gr that whenever they had to write, they would get overwhelmed by fear. Whereas among the girls, two of them had become published writers. Almost all of them were known as articulate writers in their social circles. And most of the girls said that when they sat down to write, now they were women of course, when they sat down to write, they loved writing. So this, the point here was that in some activity especially, if it's, a, if it's seen as a voluntary activity, then sometimes we may give, cor we may give correction so to inspire improvement. I'm, I'm not, I don't not, uh, I'm, I'm nothing against you, I only want you to become better. But, uh, when we especially are sharing Krishna Bhakti with people, it is that people don't see that as a necessary activity. It's voluntary. So, in voluntary activity, we just don't, we don't have to just 
give people knowledge of what to do we also have to give people encouragement and inspiration to do that so most often if somebody is given some negative feedback in a field which they feel is not mandatory and yes they most of them quit in that field we are working in a job and our boss gives us some feedback we may still feel bad but we will work to improve it because the, the job is a matter of our bread and butter but with respect to voluntary activities we are not like that and that's why it's vital that we recognize that devotees are here as volunteers and even those who are actually even if somebody say living in a temple still they are volunteers and more nowadays our whole movement is mostly congregation based so if the congregation based means they have their own families and jobs and their own life for them they are almost entirely congregation based so they are enti- they are almost entirely volunteers i would say so for us if we push them too much in the name of giving them feedback they will just leave you and it will be sad if so many people leave there's a, a famous letter that prophet wrote to karandar in Los Angeles and he, he, he said the devotional service he, he, he said should be individual spontaneous and voluntary yeah and he was he was but at the, at the same time just before that he was mentioning how he was seeing that the people were not following the process very strictly yeah he, mm. he, he mentioned this almost, almost in the same sentence first of all he mentioned that he, he saw that, that, that there was some weakness in because people weren't following very strictly and said that the management should be Should should make sure that they're chanting their rounds and following the regular Stuff. principles and such. And then he he very quickly just transitioned in, into into this into this other thing. And then he then he then later on he kind of shows how those two things are reconciled. He he he, he said what he said the devotee should be given some fresh challenge that they will rise to, and mm. and and that will inspire them. And he said but he said he said that takes expert management. Where are the where are the expert managers? So they, so they, so because like when when you hear the the management should see the chanting their rounds, it seems like you should be very heavy, right? You're you're you're, you're okay. You're not doing this. You're not doing this. But what Papa was 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 saying that because it's 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 spontaneous, individual, and voluntary, you you should inspire them. You know, and 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 uh, mm. I, I I've heard I heard the I heard this one mother. We were we were having a discussion in, in Hawaii. Was saying that that she remembered in one of the one in the early days when. There was always that uh, when Papa was coming to visit, there was always this frantic activity. Oftentimes, like some people said that the Papa always had the smell of fresh paint when he was coming to his, <laughs> his quarters. <laughs> and so, so there was always this. this oh, and, she, and she and she says, well, she says, well, I think I must have slept. She said, but I can't remember doing it in like the three days before he came, <laughs> as, as they were, beca- oh. beca- because it, it 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 was it was it was so exhilarating. They they had this challenge to try to to, to make everything ready for Prabhupada's visit, and she said, "You know, I must have slept because how can you stay up?" But but she said, "I can't remember doing it." See, it seemed like we just we we just continued, and it was a, a positive. Well, it was a positive experience. Remember, for her. it wasn't like you know, oh my God, you know, it was it was so difficult. But it was a wonderful experience when when there's like this, when there's an inspiration, then, the, like you said, this more it becomes more the experience of the heart and 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 and. and uh, More what bhakti is really about. It's supposed to be something we want to do. It's actually something that comes. It's it's it's, mm. it's 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 something that's exciting. Something that that's uh, that that's desirable, not an obligation or a burden. Like Papa said about the deity worship, the lagraha. <laughs> it's vigraha, yeah. not galagraha. <laughs> Krishna, Krishna. So this is a challenge now for us that when Prabhupada was a charismatic leader. I mean, he, he he when he was there, he was a charismatic leader, who could inspire many many devotees with enormous amount of energy. Mm. But now many devotees feel that we don't have that inspiring leaders, mm. and that's why we don't feel that inspired. Mm. So in a sense, you know, I read about a there's a Nobel laureate author, Somerset Maugham. Mm. He was asked, "Do you write every day, or do you write only when you are inspired?" Mm. So he said, "I write only when I'm inspired." And I may I make sure that inspiration arrives every morning at nine o'clock. Yes, yes. <laughs> so in a sense, uh, sometimes we uh, may r- may refuse to take up responsibility for our own inspiration. 
Hmm. That means uh, say, there's no one inspiring. That's why I'm not inspired. Hmm. Well, it may be true, but then our spiritual life cannot be dependent on whether there's an inspiring person in our vicinity or not. Hmm. As Gandhi has said that you know, be the change that you want to be in the world. Hmm. Be, be the change that you want to see in the world. So it's a. Uh, now we may not be able to inspire others, but at the very least, uh, we can try to stay inspired ourselves. And uh, that, will, that also that will inspire others. Yeah. That will inspire others. So I think that then comes down more to understanding our own individuality and contributing according to that individuality. Mm. Because what is going to inspire me? If I love someone, then whatever they tell me, I'll do. Because I just love them and I want to please that person. But when I don't have that much of a inspiring person in my life, then what is it that I can be committed to? It has to be something which, which, which connects with my deepest self. So if I, if somebody is of a kshatriya nature, or somebody likes to write, somebody likes to sing, somebody likes to study scripture, we need to give people the space to bring out their best self. That's the individual. That's the individuality yeah. part. So, yeah. to some extent, uh, when the charismatic leadership goes down, mm. or the le charismatic leader is not present to that extent, uh, then the inspiration has to come through the word is individuation. Mm. You know, each of us has to understand ourselves as an individual and how uh, we can contribute to Krishna. Mm. And this is where uh, encouragement is very much needed. Mm. I was at a, mm. Mm. so that Prabhupada was quite resourceful and uh, dynamic in terms of engaging people according to their natures. But sometimes we may become a little stereotype. This is how this is what Krishna consciousness means. You do this, you do this, you do this, you do this. But uh, there are many different ways in which uh, people may contribute to Krishna consciousness contribute to their own Krishna consciousness and to making others Krishna conscious. And uh, again we need an encouraging attitude for that. So if somebody wants to hmm, somebody has a talent for some particular field, say they they want to go into scientific research, they want to go into software development, they want to go into robotics. Mm -hmm. You know, if we have devotees who are competent in those fields and we encourage devotees to go in that field. They may not be Krishna conscious in the external sense of the word, mm. but just to have devotees of that level of competence in prominent fields, mm. that will itself in a subtle way shape society. When Bhaktivinoda Thakur said that he longs for the day when high court judges yeah. would be Vaishnavas. Yeah, yeah, you know, so I'm, I used to think, what is the way in which it will happen, if it is to happen? Hmm. Broadly, we could say there are two ways. One is that devotees form the government hmm. and then devotees appoint other devotees as high court judges. Hmm. And that doesn't seem to be a likely possibility in the near future at least. Hmm. We, even if somehow in some place, part of the world, we got power, political power also. Uh, we are struggling to manage our own oh, so that's, it's, it's a frightening thought, actually, in some, some sense. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we are struggling to we're, manage. We're not ready for it. Even if we have the opportunities there, we're not, we're not ready. Exactly. So, yeah, we're not ready. <laughs> <laughs> so the other way could be that devotees, while practicing their bhakti, are so competent in their respective fields that the, author that the government or the authorities in those fields appoint devotees in top posts. So that, a devotee, that's how Bhakti Thakur got, that's how got his position. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> he was so confident that they were in fact, the British was, were impressed. Yeah. In fact, his, he got, his getting that position was even more extraordinary because it was British India. Yes, they, they were impressed with him. Yeah. And they normally looked down upon Indians. Yeah, besides the racism. You know, in spite that's of the racism, they, were, they, they thought he was quite... Uh, they understood so, his brilliance. Yeah. That's why it's a... So in that sense, if some devotees want to excel in their own professional fields, and they take Krishna consciousness at some level in that field, mm. then we need to encourage that also. Mm. So otherwise it's very difficult to, uh, you can't at all legislate inspiration. Yes. Mm. yes. So, 
each of us has to find something that inspires us and that point which I made about taking responsibility for our spiritual advancement mm. taking responsibility to be inspired mm. so that sort of sometimes uh, in saying that we should follow the instruction of the spiritual master mm. we might uh, just outsource the responsibility for our spiritual advancement mm. oh whatever my spiritual master tells me I'll do that mm. but the spiritual master is not there really to tell you anything specific right now mm. and what do you do then I just glide along in my life doing whatever little I can do so, in a sense, uh, it has to be clear that uh, the responsibility, sometimes uh, the, 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 the responsibility for spiritual advancement for each person is with that person alone. Mm-hmm. It's not the Guru's responsibility, it is not the temple leader's responsibility. Mm-hmm. They are also there, but the primary responsibility lies with that soul itself. Mm-hmm. And in a sense, when I talk about violence, uh, that sometimes we may just thrust Krishna consciousness, thrust ideology around people's throats. And I post my talks on online also. I make a Facebook video. So one devotee commented that he said that he had thought that n- not giving people Krishna consciousness is violence. Because mm. if people are an illusion oh, huh. and if we don't enlighten them, then that is violence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that is also true. Yeah, yeah. But then, is it that we have to enlighten people in a, in a way that is enlightening for them, not alienating for them? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, Prabhupada would say, Phale na you know, that you know by the fruit. Yeah. You know yeah, a tree, yeah, know yeah, tree yeah. by the fruit. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, if yeah, somebody yeah. goes away, yeah. then what is the use? So Prabhupada said that, I was talking with Giraj Maharaj. Giraj Maharaj said that, the, what, how do, he had asked Prabhupada that, how do we know the fruit of our preaching? It's because especially in America when the devotees are preaching at that time, a lot of people were becoming devotees. Mm. Becoming devotees in our definition of the word, mm. devotees. Yeah. But in India, nobody was joining the temple, nobody was moving into the temple. So they asked, how, how should we know that uh, they are that our preaching is successful. Mm. So Prabhupada said that people, if people are inspired to make some contribution, mm. then they are, then the preaching is successful. Mm. So what does it mean by contribution? In India at that time, the primary definition was say, people become life members mm. and give some money which Prabhupada was using to build the temples. Mm. But Prabhupada also said that if people appreciate us as good people, that is also, and uh, that is also a service. So, so Giraj Maharaj is giving me the example that uh, that uh, is of course well known that when the devotees were not allowed in the Jagannath Puri temple, even now they are not allowed. Many of the non-Indians yeah. Jagannath Puri temple. So at that time, Prabhupada had gone. Prabhupada asked his disciples to go to Swami Chinmayananda, and Swami Chinmayananda was considered to be. So he he is a he is a prominent leader primarily for the Advaita tradition, mm. but he's considered a prominent Indian leader. Mm. And the devotees talk with him, and uh, uh, they presented their case, and he gave something like a certificate for the devotees, mm. saying that they are very they are authentic Vaishnavas. They have dedicated their lives to the practice of bhakti, and they are following these principles. And uh, I feel that they should be allowed to. I recommend that they are allowed to enter, enter in the temple. So now for somebody who is an established spiritual leader of another tradition, preaching to them doesn't mean that they are going to get converted, they are going to give up their tradition and come to our tradition. Exactly, yeah. But they appreciating us is also a success of our preaching. Yeah, yeah. So we can have different definitions of success mm, for cool. what is the effect of preaching mm-hmm. or what is effective preaching. And uh, I think a major... Uh, major amount of intolerance or criticism or disapproval which comes in devotee circles is because devotees are operating with very different definitions of success. Mm. If somebody's definition of success is that we should be distributing books and then if they go to a place where somebody is building temples or somebody is focused on building communities primarily, they say, what are you doing? You're not doing any service at all. Mm. Somebody who is building temples, they go and see somebody who is 
to having nice educational courses, teaching bhakti shastri or something like that. What are you doing? When when I was when I was a fairly new devotee mm -hmm. in, in America, I, I, I saw this this phenomenon quite frequently, where somebody a devotee would meet somebody, mm -hmm. another devotee, and and it was it was almost with a certain level of aggression that they would they would, they would say oh so I'm, yeah, not nice to meet you you know Chaitanya Charan Prabhu and say so so what's your program what's your program what's your program and it was and it was and it was said with a certain tone that was really justify your existence. You have to justify your existence. You're here, you're, you're breathing. Oh, justify. You at least justify your existence in Krishna well, consciousness. That's a strong way that, that, but that, that was That was the, the underlying vibration, you know. You, you feel it, you know, so what's your program? It was, it was a challenge, you know. To, you know. <laughs> Oh you're breathing air. Is, are you are you worthy of that? You know. <laughs> Please tell it to me. You know. <laughs> oh God. And the same the same thing. If you were doing the wrong thing, of course, that wouldn't be very. You know, well, that's just nonsense. And wrong according to their definition. Their of wrong. definition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. Justify. <laughs> you got very clever phrases. <laughs> that's uh, justify your existence. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! There's one senior. Yeah, there's one senior leader. I was working with him for some time, so he told me that he sees himself as a self-appointed watchdog of his con. Oh yes! <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> So, <laughs> people have to, it's interesting. Justify your existence. Uh, one challenge with, uh, at one level we need certain objective parameters for, uh, for defining whether somebody is practicing bhakti or not. Mm -hmm. In mainstream mm -hmm. society, there is this whole uh, debate that uh, there's a whole group of people who identify themselves as SBNR. This is spiritual but not religious. Yeah. yeah. So now, uh, they define spiritual as open-minded, compassionate, mm -hmm. uh, sensitive, and uh, overall they define spiritual in terms of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And they define religious in terms of dogmas and rituals. Mm -hmm. You know, you believe this, you believe that, you believe that. Mm. And you follow this, you follow that. So Prabhupada wrote a letter once to devotees, a group of devotees, Rudayan Maharaj and others who were preaching to colleges. And Prabhupada said, don't present Krishna consciousness as a set of rules to people. Mm. It's presented, it's, it's a profound philosophy. So if you start presenting it as a rule, then people say, why do I need to follow this? I just feel alienated. So there's a, a in people who leave Christianity, they're lapsed Christians they call themselves, they give it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they say there's a, there's a joke about priests. So they say, who is a priest? Is a priest is a person who is constantly worried that someone is having fun somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, mm, so, so the point that is that, that at one level, uh, if we become too rule bound, then we start appearing religious but not spiritual. Yeah, yeah. We are follow this rule, follow this rule, follow this rule, follow this rule, and sometimes, uh, you know, people who are very strict in following rules, the externals of Krishna bhakti. They are also very judgmental about others who do not follow those extremes. Yes. So then they don't come off as compassionate, they don't come off as loving, even if they might actually be concerned in their own way. So then they just reinforce the stereotype that people who are religious are not spiritual. So... There's a, this poem by William Blake that my Guru Maharaj likes, and I, I mm. can't verify it exactly, but the, the, the idea was that he says there used, and the, there used to be this beautiful green area, you know, like a park area, hmm. where they used to come and, 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 and you know, they all enjoyed themselves. And one day he came there and there was a church built there. 
in a cemetery near the church. And, a door, and, and on the door of the church says, was thou, sh thou shalt not, was written on the door. And the priests, says, were walking their rounds and binding with briars, you know, the thorny plants, the sticky mm. bushes, my, my hopes and desires. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> That's true. No, William Blake has said this, huh? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. I, I have the I have the poem someplace where I can't, I can't remember what it's called. But yeah, <laughs> binding with briars, my hopes and desires. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Krishna. Mm, so, you know, when we are spiritual. Uh, we understand that the rules and rituals, the rituals and the beliefs are important, but consciousness is even more important. And the purpose of the practices and the uh, philosophy and the, and the beliefs is ultimately to enhance the consciousness. So, I say there are two extremes. Somebody is so religious that they miss out on being spiritual. In the sense that mm, they just become so externally uh, obsessed you're doing this this and if you're not doing this you're wrong if you're not doing this like you said justify your existence to me yeah. but on the other hand there's also the other extreme that if somebody says i'm spiritual but not religious that means that they say it's all a matter of consciousness but then there is nothing in their life which uh, has been transformed by their spirituality so if somebody is being unethical Somebody is being uh, uh, cruel, somebody is uh, cheating on their partner, somebody is uh, embezzling money. Mm -hmm. And then they say I'm spiritual. That also doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So there has to be an ethical standard also. But... Uh, so, in Prabhupada's definition of, uh, uh, definition of Niyamagraha kind of, uh, uh, is related to something like that, where, where, we, where we have maybe some good intentions. Powerful. Or, you know. But, 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 we, but we don't take up any of the discipline or we take up the discipline thinking that that's an end in itself. So I'm doing this, I'm chanting this, I'm checking off my list of things, I'm you know, doing my dandabats, I'm doing this, but I'm not, it's not affecting my, my spiritual growth. You know. It could actually refer to both aspects of Niyamagra. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, you yeah. could say religious but not spiritual is the, following the, the rules but forgetting the purpose. Yes, exactly. And spiritual but not religious is just neglecting the rules entirely. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Saying that they are irrelevant. Yeah. So yeah. we could say that we want to be, mm, we want to be religiously spiritual. Yeah. yeah, we want to follow religion, and religion is the means to become spiritual. But Yamagara is a brilliant point. You know, you could connect it. So this whole analysis can be made more shastrically based. Mm -hmm. Then it becomes much clearer. Mm. It's an interesting point that uh, that going back to that point of volunteers, the people are volunteers practicing bhakti. So there are two broad understandings in, in spiritual circles or in a, in a spiritual, in something spiritual that is being practiced in the material world. Mm -hmm. There is the conception of equality and there is the conception of hierarchy. Mm -hmm. So well, This is important in this yeah. kind. <laughs> <laughs> so at the spiritual level, everyone is equal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm, but for, a, for an organization to exist of any kind, for even a religious organization to exist, there has to be some kind of hierarchy. Mm -hmm. So, if an army decide that, oh, we all have patriotic sentiment, and we'll all fight for the war. Why do we need any general, any commander? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They'll be killed, they'll be slaughtered. Yeah, they'll be terrible, yeah. <laughs> so, patriotic sentiment is definitely required for an army defending a country. Mm -hmm. But that patriotic sentiment also has to be channeled according to the authority structure of the, of the army. So similarly, uh, there has to be in principle equality, mm. where even the disciple, in the guru understand that actually the disciple is also a soul. Yeah. And I am maybe in the role of the teacher of the guru, mm. but at another level I am actually also the servant. Yes. It's not that, it's a, you know one very nice reflection I read recently that the spiritual master should, thinks that the disciple is more important than me. Even when the spiritual master is taking a more authoritative an authoritative position, and the example that of that, that of parent and child, yeah. the parents are, they will be ready to lay down their life for the children also. But they will be controlling the children. Do this. Don't do this. 
not controlling in a robotic sense but controlling an educational protective sense so similarly uh, this idea that we if we don't give philosophy to others if we don't uh, uh, don't educate them then they will uh, they are then we are doing violence mm? that idea stems more from the hierarchical conception that hierarchically you know i have knowledge they don't have knowledge which at one level is true yeah. but at another level uh, it's not that uh, people feel they don't have knowledge people feel that my life is going on well and people may not even necessarily accept uh, us as authorities so therefore in a sense when we are approaching new people we have to approach them like equals at the level of the soul this is i am a soul you are a soul and i am trying to so it's even even more so right that the soul is always accompanied by super soul and why is he there is we to guide we, them and and and, and be, because you know if we make that decision that the word we don't want to be with krishna mm-hmm. that's our decision so, and and uh-huh. krishna respects that decision but he like in 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 the bible there's the story of the prodigal son yeah now krishna is even better than the father because the father lets the son go right krishna also lets the son go but he also comes with him secret he's not going to let him go alone that's true you see there 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 such love there for, for and and so so you know not only are we are are we souls but we're beloved by krishna you know and at least uh, you know we and they are all beloved by krishna and he, and he never rejects them now after you know billions of births he's still there in the heart so this um bhakti tirtha maharaj he wrote in one of one of his books that was the uh, he that is he he was he was based on shastra but where is it in chaitanya charitamrita i think where where it says that you you can tell your level of envy by how you treat others who are lower than you on the hierarchy mm. and he and he how you to be inferior and so he he said if somebody is very envious they may not want to help others because they may feel they may become rivals to them you know if someone's very say very intelligent you know so so you so you you you're teaching somebody who's you know very intelligent person you know and if you're very envious you may think well i don't want this person to develop so great that he'll 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 supersede me <laughs> so you may want to neglect them you know or somebody somebody's a great kirtan person you're a kirtan person and he believes he said then then he then made this statement he says if somebody's just a little envious he says they will help they were to help people even to the point of having them surpass themselves and i thought mm-hmm. hmm, where's the envy there you know mm-hmm. and then he said in the third case he said if somebody is not envious at all he says they will go underneath them and push them even at the risk of their own mm-hmm. position mm-hmm. and and so i i i i i from his own stuff i kind of got the i i understand i knew kind of kind of knew what he was talking about that 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 there's this that if if we think of ourselves as superiors and 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 th- then we, we we have a little bit of ego there's a little bit of ego in our in our help mm. and so and so and so I, by by and, and this is in more the goodness right you you have that little notion of superiority right there's no yeah. there's somebody in more they, they they're very compassionate in in, in the in the in the satya loka right they only have they they have no mis- the only miseries they have is the thoughts of the the pain and suffering of the other beings but they feel that they are superior Mm. The, 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 and so the, so that by, by by helping people i'm doing i'm in some way also asserting my superiority i'm showing how compassionate i am um <laughs> so, so, some of, some of that our compassion can be an expression of our passion yeah, exactly yeah. so so some some of my service is there's a feedback loop some some of it comes back to me and and, and massages my ego some of my happiness you know, even, mm. even though i'm helping them and even even in, in a very real way and it's, 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 so it's a little envy So the, so this this notion that you were talking about seeing them really as souls and so my, i i asked some of his disciples you know to explain it to me and and they couldn't do it so but one of my dear friends is is Akavir Prabhu one of his long time mm. students and so yeah. i knew he could answer it so i asked him tell me what that is and so he told me a story he said well when he was a new man maybe with with Maharaj a couple of years it was when they had they had the institute in in Washington he said and his his job was to greet people and meet people when they would mm-hmm. come in And so he said one time he he mismentioned the Maharaj he said off hand he said you know Maharaj some of the people that are coming here they're better than I am and Maharaj said yes he says they all are 
And he wasn't trying to put Ekavir down, but he was trying to reinforce his understanding. That, yeah, so yeah, that these people are so... So, so that, that our help of people is a privilege. It's not an act of our compassion and, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, superiority in some ways. It's, it's not a part of our... Because we're so good that we're helping people, but because these people are so valuable that it's my privilege if I could do anything to help them. People will feel that. The people that are saying, justify your existence, they felt that that's how they were treated. And they, they, they feel very insecure about themselves. A lot. Just like we say that, uh, that uh, the how we had our upbringing in our childhood, mm. that shapes who we become. The same, I think, applies in our spiritual life Very also. Much, yeah. so the kind of devotees through whom we are introduced, that is like our devotional upbringing. Yeah. And that will shape how we pursue bhakti thereafter. Yes. So if we see ourselves as, if, if the only spur that we got in our early days to practice bhakti was the negative spur, you are such a fool, you are good for nothing. You have to do this. Then that's what we will give to others. Mm-hmm. It's almost like, you know, uh, there is there are some people who are abused in their childhood. And it's ironic that sometimes these people, when they grow up, they become abusers. Become abusers, yeah, they're more, they're more likely to happen. Yeah, so it's yeah. strange because yeah. if one would think that they would actually not want anyone to go through them. Yes. But yes. it is like, I don't know how much it is in India. There is there is this whole concept of ragging in college. Mm. Ragging, in ragging means we call it hazing here. Hazing. Hazing. Yeah. Oh, okay. I think it's same thing. Same thing. Yeah. So ragging. Uh, so ragging is basically you, know, you uh, deal with new students very roughly. Yeah, hazing is what we call it here. Uh, yeah, yeah. That means you know make same them thing. do kind of terrible things. Yeah. Uh, force them to do things against their will. Humiliate them in various ways. So the idea is that those children, those kids who are ragged, often they become the they become the raggers in the next after three four years. Yeah, now it's my turn. <laughs> <laughs> no. So sometimes it may become like uh, uh, we might create a tradition of ragging within our movement. Yeah. So I was ragged. I was hazed. And that's what I'll do to others. Now, it may not be conscious. It may just be that this is the only way we know to practice, uh, to practice, to teach bhakti or to train people in bhakti. That's the only thing we know. We don't know anything else. It becomes a big challenge. And if we're made to feel that we're useless, you know that that unless because you know, we, we we have the situation. Where we, we, we have the ultimate. My, my Guru Maharaj, he, he says that Srila Prabhupada convinced, convinced his students that uh, sainthood was a viable career option. <laughs> That's how he puts it. <laughs> Beautifully put. <laughs> so and so we, 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 have the, we have this high aspiration, which, which is reachable, you know, of. of, of you know, pure devotion, Krishna Prema. And, but yet, here we are in our current state. Some place, you, you, you know, most of us are in some other pl- 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 position on the, sex, on the spectrum. <laughs> very far away. Yeah, yeah very so. far away. And, and so, if we're, if, if we're made to feel that because we have so many faults and so many deficiencies that we're worthless, mm. it, it, it causes us to take unhealthy an unhealthy approach to our own weaknesses and shortcomings, uh, uh, and, and, and especially that we, we we don't want to acknowledge them, it puts it's a very strong pressure on us. And so, you know, because we, we you know we you know you know one of the big processes is, is an artha nirvritti, you know, so it means for, you know, I mean actually with, with pure bhakti, it takes the, the seed takes root in unclean soil. Mm. Right, because because the the first two leaves, the 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 uh, and Shubhada, right? They're they're removing all the negativities that are there. So there has to be something that there, 
so, so it means that it's it's not like a pure person bhakti root take roots in it. It takes root in unclean soil, and it, it can purify. So it means that it's 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 expected that we have things in us that are you know, unwanted and heartless that are that are present. True. That's normal. It's 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 and and you know, in, in the early days, especially in America, you know, people were thinking. It's also because you know, Prabhupada used to say how easy bhakti was. Yeah. And and my guru master says maybe Prabhupada didn't understand what, what that, that what Americans thought of as easy. <laughs> <laughs> the American definition of easy is like really easy. <laughs> you put uh, something in the microwave in five minutes and you know, you've got dinner, you know. <laughs> That's easy. <laughs> you know, Prabhupada came from a very different reference point. Yeah, yeah. Even today, if you tell people Krishna consciousness is easy. Yeah. Is if we consider what are the uh, we will compare then what was practice of Satyuga or Satyuga yes. or Dwapar Yuga yes and of course it is it's very but easy but then if we consider today where people are coming from what other spiritual organizations are offering them exactly as compared to that what we are offering is quite difficult <laughs> exactly <laughs> and so, so, so people were thinking that they were going to become pure devotees you know and you know they, they, had, they had the uh, what is it uh, what, what's the uh, hyper uh, Utsaha Mai very, very powerful. Yeah, yeah. yeah my very powerful. Mm. Right away, because they thought now, you know, and, and you feel they feel the transformation, you know, and so then when 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 they encountered, you know, their anarthas, mm. then they, they they felt that now you know they're fallen or they're now that they're they're they're, they're not useful, and so they became very hard on one another, on themselves and each other. So when you when you when you when you're in that mood, you you you're feeling like you're a failure. The feelings of failure. Instead of understanding that 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 the uh, anarthas are natural, mm. and and the process of working through them is is normal. So there could be two. You said about an unhealthy approach to our anarthas. There could be two unhealthy approaches. Mm. One is to cover them up. Yes. The other is to just beat ourselves down with hopelessness and self-recrimination because we have them. Yes. So yes. both are bad. Yeah. As I said, first is anartha instead of anartha nivritti, we become busy doing anartha avritti. Avritti means covering it up. Yeah. Avran is covering. Yeah. So we just co- cover often, it. Oftentimes the, the, the feeling of depression leads to the wanting to cover it up because you don't want to see it. And so, you know, so the, 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 the one, you know, the, because the, the one makes you feel like, like you're a failure and you don't want to be. Mm. So, that, so, so then you, you, you try to so there's the, the different concealment devices you fought you find fault with others you uh, uh, my guru actually did this, this whole presentation called he called the cure of souls yeah uh, about about how these unhealthy responses to our own oh, you, 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 you almost can always recognize that them there have done that or or, or that you've, you've seen the effects of it you know there are different unhealthy ways that we, so how how we can and if we if we indoctrinate people right from the beginning that now you're a worthless human, but if you take up Krishna consciousness, you'll be somebody. Then that puts them in that space of seeing all their weaknesses as mm. horrible failings. That means that they're worthless. Instead, instead of if we treat them as that that they are they are valuable, but they have so much potential. They're valuable right now. Krishna, they're dear to Krishna always, and but but and they, and they have huge potential. Yeah, I think. Then it's a different. There's attitude. two different visions also. That is our past something to be rejected for practicing bhakti, mm. or is some our past something to be connected with our bhakti practice? Mm. Is our past just a waste that we have to give up, or is the past our takeoff uh, point? Yes. You know, it is. No matter what we say, it is our takeoff point. Because we can't, uh, whoever we are, like even if you see that sometimes some people may be very well educated, not with, not necessarily educated in the sense of material education alone, mm. but people who are, say, well educated, they are professionally committed, and they are talented, they're, they're talented, they're successful in their lives, if they take up bhakti, if they take it up, then they are quite successful in their bhakti practice also because they bring hmm. an ethos of commitment to what they are doing. Hmm. On the other hand, if some people are people, na, we can't really equate material success with spiritual success. Hmm. But in some ways, 
the character qual the character that is required for material success is also required for spiritual success that's right it's a correlation so yeah. it's the only difference is that material success can possibly increase the ego so much that one will not want to surrender to krishna yeah. on yeah, the other yeah, hand material yeah. failure yeah yeah may may sub may cause the weakening of that ego and open oneself to surrender that's to krishna yeah that's true but if material failure has been uh, because one has been uh, uncommitted irresponsible and uh, reckless overall uh, sentimental then if they bring those qualities that is going to obstruct them in their spiritual growth also yeah yeah that's true oh so yeah yeah that's very true it's a it's a that acknowledge as well, i met one devotee in england he was telling me that uh, is his name was something like greg and he became somebody gaur hari or something like that he said uh, so i renounced greg and became gaur hari at the age of 18 and at the age of 40 i suddenly found that greg had come back this is you 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 understood that you recognize that that's good insight <laughs> so he said maybe for the first few years of akshita conscious practice we are so enthusiastic that even yes everything i'll give up yes. but i am who i am yes. <laughs> can't deny that <laughs> so in a sense maybe i'll uh, conclude with this that there are two only two verses in the gita which are almost repeated twice hmm. not entirely but we could say 70 80% hmm. one is the verse about fixing the mind on krishna yeah that is 9.34 and 18.65 man mana bhav mat bhakto adbhaj ani mam naskur mam evaishyasi yukt vaiva mam satyam te patijani priyosi ni 18.65 yeah. essentially says krishna says fix the mind on me It's become eight. devoted to me and that way you will come to me yes. and the only other verse that is repeated is shreyan swadharmo viguna par dharma sanushtat uh, that is 3.35 and 18.46 is 40 47 is so basically do the work according to your nature it is far mm. better to be to meet oh, even the destruction while doing the work according to your nature rather than to do some others work for person nature so then the first shreyan sadharma ni guna paradharma sanushtat so dharme nidhanam shreya paradharmo bhayavah so doing other we say we should combine those two understandings so we could say that yeah. those two we could say because they are verse repeated they are the two mm. most emphasized teachings mm. of the gita i love that so one is that we have to become devoted to krishna Huh. But the other is that we have to work according to our nature. Ah, I love that. So, shreyan so dharma mana par dharma samshad so bhav according to your nature, there will be no contamination. Hmm. So that means, of course, there is some condi- conditioning and contamination, hmm. but the further negativity that comes into our life because hmm. of working at something which we are incompatible with, that negativity can be avoided. Hmm. So it's beautiful. So it's uh, so helping people to. to be who they are at their best not necessarily conform to certain stereotypes of how they should be but just be who they are at their best so that they can offer that best to krishna in that i will say it's ultimately um ultimately the purpose of uh, of expert uh, outreacher whereas for violence would be that we force people to become what we want them to become or what we think which they should become mm, then it becomes so much problem in india especially parents are very education conscious mm. so many kids feel burdened by the expectation of the parents mm. and sometimes similarly so parents have a certain stereotype idea if the child is in this career is engineer is a doctor then his life is set and i as a parent have been successful if i make my child like this so similarly when we as we are preaching we may have certain set paradigms this is how a person who i preach to this person should become like this or this person should become like this and if they become like this then they are successful if they don't become like this then they are failures and then that pressure can be disproportionate so then because of that pressure people either try in vain to do something which they are not equipped to do and they become disheartened by that mm-hmm. or they just become alienated from us mm-hmm. because they feel that we are not really uh, help, uh, helping them much we are simply pressuring them mm-hmm. let us prabhupada expertise that he could you know prabhupada 
inspired people, but hardly Prabhupada, hardly micro-controlled anyone. Yes, so you just encourage everyone, people did wonderful things. Mm. Chai. Chai. Thank, you. Thank you for <laughs> talking.